Welcome back. Now we are at lecture five and we are getting really into density functional theory and we are going to see the fundamental theorem of DFT. So this lecture will be uh, cut in, is split in two uh, screencasts uh, so that uh, they are easier to view. Uh, the first part is now and in the first part of this uh, lecture five, so this screencast, I'm going to give you some hints on why the density is enough. So we have spent quite a bit of time talking about um, trial wave functions, which is really at the core of the hart fock approach. And now we are going to do re make really a, a big turn and uh, leave the wave functions aside and demonstrate that we can actually work with the charge density. So we are going to do that and prove that with the hornberg cohn theorems in the part two of this lecture. But on part one, I want to give you some hints as to why density is enough. And for that, we are going to revisit the one electron problem again. So before we do, we go there, I'm going to introduce you a, a functional, so a function of the function, which is a functional that has to do with the kinetic energy. It's uh, due uh, um, by, it's, it's, uh, it was developed by uh, Van Feisacker and uh, the shape is like the one that you show here. Uh, I'm not going to demonstrate how we get to this point, but I'm going to show you that that functional for the kinetic energy is actually exact for the single electron system. And by showing it's exact, I'm going to keep going and show you that you can rewrite the problem of the one electron problem using only the density. So of course, this is not a proof. The density is generally enough, but that's already giving you a good hint as the density at least works for a one electron. I mean, you can also put it in a different way. If we were not able to create, uh, if we were showing that it's not possible to express the one electron problem with density, clearly it's hopeless to hope to treat many electron problems with, uh, with density. So let's do this. So for, for one electron, of course, the density can be obtained directly from the, from the square, so the, modulus, the square modulus of the wave function here. Again, I'm using a real wave function, but it's, you can use this for complex wave function if you, if you want. Uh, obviously, the derivative of the density with respect to the position, uh, so we are doing one electron in one dimension, but it can, it's, easy, it's easy to do it in three dimension. The, the derivative is kind of elementary. And of course, that means that the square of the derivative is also elementary. Now, if we divide this by n, we obtain this value here. And we see that uh, the n prime square, I'm sorry, there's a prime missing in this equation on the, on the last equation I just showed. Uh, the n prime square divided by n is equal to four phi prime x um, square. Nice. Now that means that if I integrate now n prime square over n and divide by eight is the same as one half of the integral of five primes x square eight of the x, which is obviously the kinetic energy of the single electron. So for the single electron, in other words, this functional there, so the one eighth integral of n prime square over n dx, which is called the von Feisenker functional, is exact for the kinetic energy of the one electron. So that's nice because now that means that we can write, uh, we can write easily the energy of the problem as following. Uh, we, the energy of the problem is just the kinetic energy plus the interaction of the, with the external potential. Of course, here, our life is made so, so much easier that we don't have to worry about electron-electron interactions since there is only one electron. So clearly this energy is a functional of the density for one electron, meaning that we can rewrite the whole pro the entire problem uh, just with the density. And what we have to do is to minimize that energy functional with the constraint that the number of electron is, of course, uh, kept constant. Here I put n, but I could have put one since n equal one in this case. So the fact that we can recast the problem using the density functional, it's not really surprising because in our case, since the density is just the square modulus of the wave function, there is the same amount of information in, in the two, in the two uh, problems. 
uh, of course, with the fact that we are we do not have the the complex part of the wave function, but since in this case it's real, it's not an issue. So um, we can we can calculate now uh, the derivative, the functional derivative of the energy, uh, using the functional derivatives that we have discovered in the separate screencast. Uh, so this is the von Feisacker um, kinetic energy again. Uh, remember the, the uh, this this is actually a, a uh, this is actually not a local functional, it's a semi-local one because it depends on the first derivative of the density. And we can use the relationship that we saw in the, screen in the other screencast for the functional derivative. This is the general uh, formula. And we can calculate the functional derivative of t with respect to n. And of course, if we apply the relationship, it's actually pretty elementary, I'm going to le let you do it. But the answer is obtained by this. So this is the functional derivative of the kinetic energy. I'd like to attract your attention to something that even though we have a very simple problem of one electron, the functional derivative of the kinetic energy is not a trivial function. I mean, it depends on the, on the first derivative, the second derivative, and, 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 and the density itself. Uh, and this is just for one electron. So that should give you a hint that the kinetic energy, at least the functional derivative of the kinetic energy in general is a pretty complex uh, function. So uh, now we can, uh, we can actually, if you want, I can actually prove this. I just told you that I was going to leave, leave, it, to you, to, uh, leave it to you, but we can actually do it. Uh, we can calculate the different terms of the functional derivative. First, the one in blue uh, is simply the derivative of S with respect to N, which is fairly trivial here because, of course, N is it's, it, it's just the, the N in the denominator. And the function and the derivative of f with respect to n prime is also elementary uh, from a, from a calculus from elementary calculus. Now, if we take the derivative with respect to x of that green of that orange box, we obtain uh, this term directly. And then, if we put back everything together like this, we obtain three terms. But two of the terms are similar, so they can be they can actually be added, and we obtain finally the result. So this is why um, I find it quite useful if you want to do density functional theory to first learn a little bit about functional derivatives because this is not necessarily uh, obvious uh, based on the, the calculus that we use for, for regular function of variables. So we can now cast the problem of the one electron using the variational problem. Uh, again, this is the function we want to derive, uh, to, to, to minimize. Uh, which is the energy with the constraint uh, using a Lagrange multiplier on the, on the number of electrons. Again, I put n, uh, n is equal to one in the one electron case, of course. And we calculate the functional derivative of this, which is, of course, this derivative. Uh, I did not provide in detail the functional derivative of the, of the external, uh, the energy due to the external potential, but it's a trivial one uh, because it's, of course, a local functional. Um, and then we, we do that, uh, and then we keep, we keep going, uh, we keep uh, working our way, and we obtain finally the function that we, we, we obtain a, a differential equation, really, for the density. Uh, this is what we obtain using the result from the previous slide for the derivative of the von Feisacker uh, kinetic, the kinetic energy. And we end up with a di differential equation, no longer of the wave function, but of the density. So we could actually solve that problem directly to get a density. Well, of course, you will realize that, uh, as, I, as I already said before in previous screencasts, is that the left-hand side, so the operator, if you want, in front of n, also depends on n. And uh, that means that we are going to have to do a self-consistent loop, So uh, because we need to know the answer in order to calculate the answer. So we start from a guess, and then we keep iterating until the guess and the solution uh, are the same. So it's interesting because you can actually apply that to a very elementary problem, like a particle in a box. So if you were looking at a particle in a box, which is a problem that we solve uh, pretty much the first problem we solve in, in quantum physics, introductory quantum physics even, uh, we find uh, the density and we find also the chemical potential, which actually correspond to the energy of, of the state. So that's, that's nice. Now, this is what we can do in one dimension. Uh, for one electron, uh, but uh, we can say a bit more actually. So uh, we are we can go back and, and think about the role of the density. 
Of course, the trivial result is that if we know the wave function, we can know the density. That's always true. Uh, uh, we just saw it for one electron, but we saw it for many electrons in the last lecture on, on Hartree-Fock. Now, the, the big question is, is the density enough? Uh, so what we would re really want, want to know is that, sure, we can get the density from the wave function, but can, could we get the, the, the wave function from the density? So this is really the, the, the crucial part. Uh, of course, if, we, if everything was fine, everything was right, uh, uh, if the density was a good variable to solve the quantum uh, mechanical problem in our situation, that would, the, the question mark would not be there, it would be true. It turns out it is true, and we are going to prove it in all generality, and we, we just saw it, uh, of course, for the one electron. Now, there is another hint uh, that I would like to go back, uh, something that we've, a name that we've already seen uh, in a previous lecture, uh, also relating the fundamental problem of solving the uh, time-independent uh, Schrodinger equation with the Hamiltonian and the knowledge of the density. And this is related to Cato. So remember, we, we saw the Cato theorem about the cusp of the wave function at the origin. Now we can, we can uh, it turns out that in, in that paper in, in 1957 from Cato, uh, the result that was found is that for, for many electron problems, so in many ions, like a position at position RK, so capital RK, uh, it turns out that uh, Cato demonstrated in that paper that uh, the, the charge, the atomic charge uh, at the ion K, uh, is actually given by the equation in the box. So I'm not going to demonstrate this, but the, the result is actually quite illuminating because what it says is that uh, uh, in that equation, A0 is just a, a, a distance, right? It's, yeah, it's the, uh, the, the atomic length. Uh, the, densi the density is there and R is the, is the, uh, is the, the radius of, for example, in spherical coordinates. Now, what's interesting in this is that this Cato theorem shows that uh, you only need the density to, 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 to essentially define your problem. Because remember, the problem, we, the, the kinetic energy and the electron-electron the electron interactions are universal. This is true for, those, those operators are true for any problems that we are looking at. But uh, the external potential, which is defined by the atomic charge ZK and by the position of the ion RK, are, they are what defines your problem, really. This is what makes a problem different from one another. Now, what, what this equation shows is that there is a relationship between the, the knowledge of the density and the knowledge of the external potential, since it provides information on RK and ZK. So before I, I go there a little bit more in detail, I'd like to show you something that I find quite important when you read papers and or even when you plot things. Uh, this is the, the atomic densities, how we plot them. So here, it's a typical uh, graph that we see very often. For example, it's for argon. And I marked the minima, some, some minima and the maxima uh, with uh, horizontal, uh, vertical lines. And if you, if you look really close to zero, uh, you find that the, the density, the, that plot shows you the density goes to zero, but it's actually not true. Uh, remember, here, you have to look very carefully at the label on the axis. Uh, the the y-axis is not the density itself. It's 4 pi r squared times the density, so it's a radial density. In other words, it's essentially the density that if you sit on the ion, which is shown on the, on the, on the graph on the right-hand side at the center, that 4 pi r square nr is essentially the density that's integrated over a shell at distance uh, r from the origin and, and of which dr. So of course, as we go further and further, that the volume of that shell increases, obviously, it, uh, and also because that volume is 4, 4 pi r square dr, and that means that and on the other side, if you're really close to the ion, or in fact you're, you're on the ion, r is equal to zero. In that case, 4 pi r squared and r is equal to zero. But this is misleading a little bit. Uh, I mean, this is typical what, typically what we do, but it's quite misleading because the density is not zero. It's just that the, the graph is zero because r is equal to zero. So just, I just want this to be clear to everyone because sometimes 
uh, we make interpretation of pl on plot which are in fact quite uh, quite misleading. Now, why do we do four pi r square and r? It's just that way we see really at what distance there are maxima in the density, and that allows you to see the shells of electrons. For example, on argon, that's what you see. You see there is a shell very close to the, the ion, then there is one about uh, 0 0.25, and and then another shell at around 1.2, things like that. So that's very useful. Now, if we if we recast this using, using the, those notations, uh, we see that uh, the, the density, the derivative of the density is minus 2z and 0 at i equals 0. So that's, uh, that's, that's the cattle theorem uh, at the origin there. So that's quite nice. Uh, so the electronic shell are, are visible, but don't be fooled when you look at pictures like this. Do not say the density is zero at, at, the, at the ions. This is actually not true. Uh, it's just that four pi r square and r is zero at the origin. Now let's go back to the cattle theorem to wrap this up. Uh, the, the equation there on the left is the Schrodinger equation. This is the exact Schrodinger equation that we, I mean, this is Hamiltonian really, that we are trying to solve. There is no approximation in this one. Uh, the problem is defined by the number of, of electrons, n, is defined by uh, the atomic charge z on the different ions, which are positioned at capital R. But those values Z and R, as well as N, because uh, uh, N, capital N, the number of electrons, is obtained by the, the integral of N uh, of the density. So all those information that define, all, those, all that information that defines your problem are obtained, can be obtained from the density according to the cattle theorem. So I hope this is clear. So the cattle theorem basically gives you a hint that the density is likely to be a good variable to use. Uh, and I should say that I started with the one electron problem, but the cattle theorem is, is true in general. In fact, it's true in, for every columbic type uh, interaction between, between, uh, between the particles. So we can get all the information from, from the density. This is basically what the cattle theorem says. So that's quite interesting. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good hint telling you that the density is, is the good, good variable. You can get the number of particles, as I said, you can find uh, the place of the nuclei at the cusp of the density. That's really what we already discussed. And of course, you can get the charge as well. So this is all we need to specify the complete Hamiltonian. So this is uh, something I, I, I actually uh, got this from one of the reference um, that, that, I propose, that I provided on lecture zero. And I find uh, this conversation actually quite useful because it provides something that's uh, that, that's that's be, before the hornberg cohn uh, uh, theorem for density functional theory. So talking about the hornberg cohn theorem, uh, we are going to to tackle that in the second part of this screencast. Uh, th the famous paper was in 1964 from Hornberg and Cohn, uh, and that paper establishes uh, that the density is the good variable to solve the problem. And this is what we are going to demonstrate. Um, as I like to say, and I'm going to end this screencast on that note, is, it's quite interesting. There is a typo in the date of that paper. Uh, there is no, unless it was a different month in November, November I don't know how to say it. Uh, that's quite interesting in 1964. Uh, this is not so relevant for our quest of understanding DFT, but that's always good to do this. Uh, thank you very much and, and see you back on part two.